from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to everyone who is joining us online this beautiful Sunday morning from St. Andrew's United Methodist Church here in Orangeburg. Pastors Carol and Robert are away today. Our guest preacher is the Reverend Rudy Gwaltney, pastor of the Vaucluse Pentecost Charge in the Greenwood District. He preached here three years ago as a lay servant and is now serving as a pastor. Rudy, welcome back to St. Andrews. You are invited to join us online this Wednesday at 7 p.m. for a Bible study. Pastor Carol will lead us as we look at Mary Magdalene, first person recorded to have seen Jesus after his resurrection. Let us now open our hearts for worship by lighting the Paschal candle as a sign of Christ's presence with us. darkness and lead us to the heart of God. Our hymn of praise will be number 303 in hymnals, the day of resurrection, and the words will be on the screen.
like to remind you that uh, Pastor Carol posts a children's message each week on our Facebook page. As we prepare for prayer, prayer, we have concerns and joys to share. We want to lift up Richard and Andrew Williamson upon the death of their grandmother, Harriet Williamson, this past Sunday. We lift up all doctors, nurses, and hospital employees who are caring for people during this coronavirus pandemic. We lift up people of our church family who are living with cancer, Nita Haynes, Freddie Riley, Cheryl King, Catherine Jones, and Melissa Judy. We'd also like to lift a friend of our church, Rosalind Tyson Cox, who is fighting the coronavirus in a Virginia hospital at this time. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, many believers today are not allowed to gather in their sanctuaries due to COVID-19. Many churches, as we do, have the ability to stream the Sunday morning services online or on Facebook. This does not lessen our need to worship you, Heavenly Father. Our need for you is greater today than it was yesterday. Our need for you today is less than it will be tomorrow. The leaders of our great United States of America need your guidance more now than ever before. Please be with them, Lord, as they make the difficult decisions that are heavy on their shoulders. Decisions that will be applauded by some and criticized by others. Give them the strength to make the decisions that are best for us all. Dear Lord, we are saddened by the deaths of so many due to the virus that is sweeping our country. It is devastating, but let us not forget that there are also many who each and every day die from other causes, traffic accidents, heart attacks, cancer, suicide, murders, just to name a few. These are also tragic deaths that take away fathers, mothers, husbands, wives, sons and daughters. These deaths are no less devastating than deaths by the virus. Let us remember them all equally. Guide us, Heavenly Father, to do what is right, to do our best, to do what is honorable in your sight, to be faithful and obedient to you always. These things we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. We want to thank everyone who has continued to give in support of St. Andrew's Ministries. As you are able, please continue to mail in your offerings. Now I invite you to enjoy God's presence with you as Elizabeth Woodall plays the offertory music.
Our hymn of preparation will be on page 378 in the hymnal if you have one, or the words will be on the screen. This is Amazing Grace. Good morning, St. Andrews. It's a blessing to be here with you today. And for those that don't know me, my name is Rudy Gwaltney. I live up the street in Bamberg. I have uh, helped to run the Visiting Nurses Association for the last 35 years and was a member at Trinity United Methodist for 30 years. I served as a Gideon for 10 years and a lay speaker for four years before my appointment. And I share all that with you because I wanted to just take a moment to thank Robert and Carol Cannon, who were my pastors for six years. They mentored me along the path of becoming a pastor, and they and your former pastor, David Kaufman, have been a, a big help to me. So I just wanted to express my love for them. I know this congregation loves them as well, and just wanted to take that moment to share that with them. The scripture reading for the day comes from the book of John, chapter 20 verses 19 through 31. 
On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my fingers where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Praise Thanks be to God. God. In my sermon message last week, I defended the reputation of Mary Magdalene, who has been incorrectly referred to throughout some times in history as a harlot. And today, I'm going to defend Thomas's reputation just a little bit because I believe branding him as doubting Thomas is just a little bit unfair. So as our scripture reading opens today, we are on the evening of the first Easter and we find the disciples, less Thomas, locked in a room, hiding from the authority figures, probably fearing the same fate that Jesus had was awaiting them. By this point, they know that the tomb is empty. Mary Magdalene has told them. Peter and John have raced to the grave site and found and confirmed that Mary's report that the body is missing. Mary, who had been with them through most of Jesus' ministry, has come back and reported that Jesus is risen. Her exact words were, I have seen the Lord. And they obviously have not believed her, for they sit in hiding, trembling with fear, acting as if their rabbi is dead. Jesus had told his disciples on the night of the Last Supper, he said, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Yet still... They are afraid. When suddenly behind locked doors, Jesus appears to them, and he says, peace be with you. Can you try to imagine for just a moment what they experienced? In one moment, going from fear and unimaginable grief to unimaginable joy. They heard the words, peace be with you, and they are forever changed forever transformed and forever believing. All except for Thomas, who is not with them. Let's take a quick look at that phrase, peace be with you. It's not a normal construct in the English language. The original Hebrew text uses the word Irene for peace. In Greek mythology, Irene, or as we pronounce it, Irene, was the goddess of peace, the actual personification of peace. And in the text today, the word Irene is meant more like the Jewish concept of shalom. 
It's more than just peace. It's more than just an absence of conflict. Instead, it is an entire wholeness that is a gift from God. It is a mental and an emotional strength. It's one of the fruits of the spirits mentioned in Galatians 5. So when we say, peace be with you, it is a pronouncement of well-being, of wholeness. Essentially, I consider it to be a blessing. So as we move forward, Thomas returns at some point, and Jesus is no longer with the disciples. And the scripture tells us, now Thomas, one of the twelve, who was not with the disciples when Jesus came, so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. You know, if you think about it, we have seen the Lord. Those are basically the exact same words that Mary Magdalene used to share the good news to the disciples after her encounter with the risen Lord. The disciples didn't believe her. And now with those same words, Thomas does not believe the other disciples. You see, we have uh, branded Thomas as doubting Thomas. But in reality, all of the disciples doubted. They were all doubters until their doubts were erased after their, after their doubts became belief with their first encounter of the risen Lord. Thomas was just like them. He could not accept, he could not conceive of the news of the resurrection. He had to see Jesus for himself. So perhaps Honest Thomas is a more fitting name than Doubting Thomas. Please also note that Thomas is not a meek person. He's not a coward. When Jesus made the decision to head to Judea to raise Lazarus, This was the same place that just a little earlier the Jews had tried to stone Jesus and the other disciples are trying to talk him out of it. And it was Thomas who stood up to the disciples and said, let us also go that we may die with him. No, Thomas is no coward. Yes, he doubted, but no more so than the other disciples. He just cannot believe their testimony. And his frustration finally gets to him and he tells them, I will not believe. You see, Thomas had been a believer in Jesus. He had followed Jesus, fully expecting to be put to death with him. He was zealous for Jesus. And now after the crucifixion, he is crushed. All the belief that he had has drained out of him. You could actually go so far as to say that he probably felt betrayed by Jesus. You know, there was a time early in Jesus' ministry when he returned to the town of Cana in Galilee, the place where he performed his first miracle, turning the water into wine, and he expressed his own frustration. Jesus said, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. And now Thomas, in his frustration, has said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. And I realize that statement is probably just hyperbole. In Thomas's frustration, he makes an extreme exaggeration to make a point. But now Thomas goes even further than those who needed to see signs and wonders to believe. He actually not only stated his unbelief, but he put conditions on our Lord for what would have to happen in order for him to believe. And knowing what Thomas had gone through, Jesus shows him compassion, and he doesn't rebuke him as he appears again. The scripture tells us a week later his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. 
Here at the second appearance, Jesus once again appears behind the locked doors, but all the fear is now gone. And then he turns to Thomas and he says, put your fingers here, see my hands, reach out and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. So Jesus, instead of rebuking Thomas, offers to him that which he says he needs to believe. Nothing indicated that Thomas actually came and touched the wounds as with the other disciples, seeing the resurrected Christ was enough. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Now Thomas has gone from unbelief to making the strongest confession of faith that we will find anywhere in the Gospels. My Lord and my God. As a pastor friend of mine put it, he has gone from being the greatest doubter to the greatest believer. But now we get to what I consider the key verse for today. Talking to Thomas, Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Last Sunday, Pastor Carol brought us a powerful message here about hope. The message of Easter morning is a message about hope. The tomb is empty. Our Lord is risen. He's overcome the grave. He is risen. He is our hope. Today's message, the message of Easter afternoon, is about belief. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. See, Jesus is not only speaking to Thomas, he's speaking to all of us as well. To all who will read the Gospels, hear the good news, and believe in him. That's why the story of Doubting Thomas is in the three-year lectionary recommended preaching cycle for pastors as a topic every year, just like Christmas and the Transfiguration and Easter. You see, this is Jesus' final blessing. It is a blessing for those who were not and could not be present during his ministry. It's a blessing to all who will follow and who will believe in him. And those words were very important to the early Christians living in or near the time of Jesus as they were undergoing great persecution. These words encouraged those who didn't see him and who didn't know him. These words have been an important encouragement to all Christians throughout the generations since the time they were recorded. Jesus was speaking to Thomas, but he was also speaking to us. To all of you who are listening to our message today, to all of those that came before you, to you, to your children, to your grandchildren, and to all the generations who will follow us until the time that Christ comes again. I'd like to share a little more recent story with you today about belief. Several years ago, while I was still a member at Trinity, I was asked to help chaperone a trip for the youth group. They were uh, going on a field trip up into the upstate, into the Greenville area. I was told that we were going to see a Jeremy camp. And I did not know what a Jeremy camp was and didn't realize until just before we departed that it wasn't a type of camp that we were going to, but that instead that Jeremy camp was the name of a young Christian musician. And the kids got a good laugh at my expense all the way up to Greenville that night. But I remember that evening vividly. Three very significant things happened for me. The first was I heard for the first time the song, This Man, which is one of my favorites. And it asked the listener, as you see Jesus on the cross, it says, would you take the place of this man? Would you take the nails from his hand? And it's given me a lot to think about. The next thing I remember from that evening was during the intermission, we adopted or sponsored, if you would, a three-year-old little Ethiopian girl named Nagatua from Compassion International. 
That young lady's going to turn 17 next month. And my correspondence with her has been a blessing to me, and it has helped keep me well grounded during periods when I thought I was going through hard times. I know that right now all of us are going through hard times. Many of you cannot work. Many of you cannot get out to see your loved ones. Many of you are sick. Many of you are avoiding treatments because of this virus. But knowing Nagatua has kept me well grounded because knowing the conditions that she lives in, I realize how truly blessed we are even during these very, very difficult times. The thing I remember most from that evening is Jeremy Camp telling the story of his wife, Melissa, of how she had been diagnosed with ovarian cancer and it had spread through her entire body. And then she had been miraculously healed. They were married a month later and shortly after their honeymoon, the cancer came back with a vengeance. And a little later, she was taken to be with the Lord. Melissa had said on several occasions, if just one life comes to know Jesus through my cancer, it will all be worth it. And that's one of the most powerful statements of belief I think I've ever heard. If just one life comes to know Jesus through my cancer, it will be worth it. As part of the answer to her prayer about two weeks after her death, the Holy Spirit told Jeremy to pick up his guitar, something he hadn't wanted to do. It was really the last thing he wanted to do on that day. But he picked it up and he wrote the song, I Still Believe. And in the song, he describes the struggle and the pain at the loss of his wife. It reminded me much of the man who told Jesus, Lord, I believe but help my unbelief. The Lord called Jeremy to pick up his guitar and to use the talents that he had been given. He has traveled the world sharing Melissa's story with unknown thousands upon thousands of people at the concerts that he gives. That story's just now been made into a movie called I Still Believe. It was in the theaters prior to the virus outbreak and it's now streaming on the cinemas at Amazon and DirecTV and other sites. It's an excellent film. But the point is, is that now her story is being shared with millions. A testimony to the power of prayer from a faithful servant of God. As I close today, I want everyone to realize that the gospel writers wrote their books as a testimony to the risen Lord so that others could receive the good news, so that others could believe. Matthew wrote to his fellow Jews, to those that were familiar with the Old Testament, so that his readers would know that Jesus is Israel's Messiah and that their holy scriptures are fulfilled in him. Mark wrote to the people of the Roman Empire in a manner for people who were not familiar with the Old Testament. He focused on Jesus' ministry and his teachings and his miracles. Luke tells us directly in his gospel that he is not an eyewitness, but that he has interviewed and recorded eyewitness testimonies so that his readers would have an orderly account of the things believed among us. And finally, John, the writer of the last gospel, was an eyewitness to the life of Christ. John writes to let us know that Jesus was the eternal God who became man. He tells us directly at the close of the day scripture lesson why he wrote his gospel. He said, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. These are written that you may believe. And John further emphasizes that point in the next chapter as he concludes his gospel after the ascension. He once again tells us, this is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. 
we know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. These gospel writers and the disciples did not do their work to receive fame or fortune. Far, far from it, as they spread the good news around the Mediterranean region of the world, they were persecuted, and all but John were martyred for the faith, for sharing the message of the good news. They spread the message as part of their belief in and their love for Jesus. They accepted their commission so that others would come to have a saving knowledge of our Lord. Make no mistake, they doubted. And all of us at some point will struggle with doubt through our lifetimes. But just as he did with Thomas, Jesus comes to us and can give us what we need to overcome doubt so that we can move from the dark places into the light. The Lord left us with his great commission to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am always with you to the very end of the age. You see, those who love the Lord share their belief. Those who love the Lord share their hope. Those who love the Lord share their love. Melissa Camp prayed, if just one life comes to know Jesus through my cancer, it'll be worth it. Melissa Camp loved the Lord. As part of the answer to her prayer, Jeremy wrote the song, the book, and eventually helped with the movie adaptation of I Still Believe. And I'm going to close today with the lines from the song's chorus. These words were written through Jeremy's pain and suffering. I still believe in your faithfulness. I still believe in your truth. I still believe in your holy word, even when I don't see, I still believe. Amen and amen. If you would now, let's sing our closing hymn, which is number 310, He Lives. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to show us the truth, the way, and the life. Thank you for the lessons that he taught his disciples and their faithfulness to share it with others. Thank you for today's lesson on Doubting Thomas. Thank you for the life of Melissa Camp and her special prayer. And thank you for answering that prayer many, many, many times over. And now, my friends, May the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forever. Amen.